Uh, so, here is my a topic. It's, it's about integrating citizen science um, and policy support tools, various po policy support tools into water and land resources management um, for sustainable mountain development. So, um, so this year is, uh, <coughs> is all about sustainable um, development goals. So where we can see the links between sustainable development goals and, and mountains. So here we have new agenda. So let's conserve and sustainably use fresh water resources as well as mountains and, and, and other, other different habitats. And in next, so we, we can see explicitly in, in, in three different, different goals where mountains are explicitly mentioned to, to achieve sustainable goal, goals in the next, next 10 years or, or next 10 to 15 years. So why do we need citizen science and policy support systems for mountain environments, which, which are usually data poor and inaccessible? Um, so uh, there are a lot of investment we need to maintain various uh, uh, monitoring stations. So we need to do more, more sustainably by using citizen science. And in, in mountain environments, um, people have very little opportunities other than land and water resources based, based activities, livelihood activities. And in higher elevations where uh, climate change impact is, is more, more and more evident, so we have, to, we, have to, we have to do more closely, we have to work more, more closely with, with local communities. So the rainfall patterns, snowfall patterns, all these are changing. So we have to understand how this kind of hydrometeorological changes are occurring. So for, to, to, to understand this, we have to work with, with, with local communities. So what is citizen science? It's basically about working with the general public who are non-scientists, but they can help us to, to collect data, co to co-generate various knowledge and, uh, and data systems for for improving our understanding how hydrometeorological systems are working. And to do that, we can, we can install various sensor-based uh, instruments for data collections so we can improve natural, natural data sets and, and we, we, we can apply this data for monitoring as well as modeling of various ecosystem services. And, and citizen science is bottom-up approach, so we, we mobilize local communities, local stakeholders, to collect data uh, and, and to improve the knowledge. So it is basically science-driven, community-based decision-making uh, to maximize resource utilization for hu human well-being. So here are just some, some examples of how we, uh, we mobilize local communities to collect data, uh, data sets. For example, rain gauges, uh, river flow, and various hydrometeorological uh, data sets. And we also do various uh, uh, locally based participatory approach. We discuss with community people, various stakeholders, um, and we listen to them how, how they understand uh, their natural environment, how, how their social environment is, uh, is changing over the time, and, and from their knowledge, from their perception, we can, we can better understand the mountain environment, mountain ecosystem services, and their uses, uh, uses for a local, local development. So we, for example, uh, for example, this one is uh, land and water resources management using crop calendar, in which year um, uh, the water is, is being used in, 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 in agricultural practices, and how uh, different, uh, I mean, changing pattern of snow and rainfall is, is affecting in their agricultural practices. So now, once we understand how uh, citizen science can help in, in, in better data and better knowledge at local level, and then we have to understand how we can make it more sustainable. So, so how these monitoring uh, stations can be sustainable, and how, what would be the uh, best communication strategy, and what's the strategy for policy, impa policy impact? How can you use this data and knowledge into, into policy, policy level? 
Um, so overall, the, uh, what is the purpose of data generation and how can make them more relevant at, at, at policy level? So we, we did various participatory discussion at a community as well as institutional level. We, we, interact, we interacted with uh, village heads, community members. We did research, uh, resources mapping and we also applied app, uh, um, web-based policy support tools, for example, water roll and costing nature. Um, and, and we also did multidimensional poverty and livelihood strategies. And in the next, after, after collecting data using the citizen science, so, so there is a need for policy support tools to, to best use of those collected data from, from hydrometeorological stations, local understanding of various ecosystem services, all those things. Uh, we often um, know in, in data poor environments, the data are not being properly used in, in decision making. And, and in recent days, special and all the modeling, modeling tools are, are well recognized, their capacity to influence at, at local as well as, uh, as basinical decision making. So, and in that sense, uh, we, we could link past land use uh, legacies and, and future land use trajectories in, in mountain environments which are more and more vulnerable to, uh, to climate change. But still there is, uh, <clears throat> uh, there is great recognition of uh, policy support tools, but uh, the use of these policy, policy support tools is, is, still, is still not, uh, uh, not well uh, in, in, in remote areas. So because maybe lack of data or more expensive data, uh, maybe they don't have enough training or capacity to use these tools, or, or, or we don't have good, good data to, to do these uh, policy support tools or modeling of these uh, various um, data sources. And the best, uh, I mean the, some of the best uh, uses are policy, policy relevant uh, applications of these policy support tools will be uh, scenarios and interventions. If, if we use different scenarios, for example, climate change or, or land use change scenarios, then what will be the impact on the ground in terms of water availability or change in, in, in agricultural practices? So for example, here, water wall tool which, uh, which uh, we, we use in, in understanding the uh, hydrological ecosystem services so we can apply uh, climate change scenarios, uh, including recently uh, introduced uh, uh, IPCC's fifth, uh, fifth assessment scenarios. And similarly, we can use uh, various land, land use change scenarios and uh, as well as uh, land management options to understand uh, what's the impact on, on land and, and um, uh, water resources management at, at lo local level. So uh, <clears throat> we have four mountainous sites, and the, this one is, is, is from Nepal, a high mountainous area um, where water resources is, uh, is, is very rare. It's semi, semi-arid uh, environment, less than 250 millimeter per year of rainfall, and uh, very less vegetation along the valleys. Uh, these valleys are kind of oasis type of agricultural practices. Um, and, uh, and rest is uh, very barren area and, uh, and high mountains are cover, covered with snows which are uh, largely affected by, by climate change um, uh, in the region. <clears throat> um, water resources is the, is the primary resources at, at local level. They use for agricultural production and there are also other, other activities, for example, micro hydropower, uh, along the basins, uh, some water resources are highly valuable for cultural, spiritual uh, purpose. But uh, as I said, the reason is uh, it is very dry, low precipitation, and people are saying the uh, the pattern of snowfall and rainfall is is changing in recent years. So that has been affecting. Uh, directly into their into their agricultural practices, uh, there is low availability or or change in water availability uh, during the uh, during the year during the different uh, different seasons. 
Um, as I said, uh, again, the land resources, which is very, very limited because of the very barren, uh, barren landscape, wherever the land, uh, agricultural land is, which is very, very valuable for, for agricultural productions. Um, and their, uh, their livelihood is, is directly uh, based on, on that limited uh, availability of uh, land resources. And these uh, land resources are extensively used for uh, various cereal, uh, cereal crops and nowadays more on cash crops like apple farming, which is also a kind of adaptive measure to, to deal with, with changing climate. <laughs> And the reason is, uh, is also very, very uh, important for hazard mitigation, which is a, a water-induced hazard. So we need to know the hydrological um, processes. Uh, we need to know the changing uh, snowfall pattern, changing rainfall pattern, so uh, the vulnerable uh, settlements as well as, as, well as uh, agricultural land can be protected. So all of this, we don't have data. So that's why I'm talking from the beginning, we need citizen science. <clears throat> we need to mobilize local communities, local stakeholders, so they can collect, <clears throat> they can participate in, in co-generation of data, and that can be directly useful for, uh, for protecting, uh, for example, vulnerable settlements as well as, as, well as agricultural uh, land. And similarly, biodiversity, mountains are, are usually very rich for uh, biodiversity, mammals, uh, uh, all bird species, uh, herb species. For example, this part of Himalayas, which, uh, which is a trans-Himalayan region, uh, because of that unique geographical uh, region, uh, the area is very rich in, in a number of herb species, which is highly valuable highly um, uh, valued uh, in terms of uh, uh, monetary value for, for um, local people so they can collect and they can sell. But changing, um, changing weather, changing all the climatic impact, the availability, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the harvesting of this kind of harvest species is also directly affecting. So we have to um, we have to understand all these changes. So in that sense also, uh, mobilizing local communities, understanding their, their views on, on these various ecosystem services is, is, is quite important. And certainly ecotourism, uh, landscape-based ecotourism or cultural, spiritual-based spiritual um, eco, ecosystem services are also quite important. Um, the beautiful landscape, in the Himalayas and, uh, and coexistence of uh, different uh, religion, uh, heritages, and, uh, and that makes uh, the reason is, is, is quite important for local livelihoods and, and, uh, and, and some, some, some local communities who are in, in, in poverty. So that kind of understanding is, is, is quite important for them. <clears throat> <clears throat> this particular region, which is, uh, which is a conservation area zone, so, so from, from conservation organization like uh, Annapurna Conservation Area Program, they introduce conservation fee whenever people, people go into, into that region. So that kind of uh, ecotourism-based earning is, is, is useful for, for not only uh, managing conservation area, um, uh, areas, but they are also useful for uh, improving uh, ecotourism hotspots in, in the region. But um, whether, whether that conservation fee, the collected revenue is, is equitably used and, um, and people are getting benefit at local level, that's still a big question. <clears throat> so further going into much detail, so uh, here is, uh, um, we selected two, two villages in that in that region, <clears throat> so again, these are very very dry region. Um, so water resources, whatever water comes uh, along the stream, these are all diverted to to agricultural land. 
but <coughs> but the water resources availability is is uh, is, uh, is it changed people said the snowfall is uh, is occurring in different season and rainfall is uh, is is not happening in in right time so their agriculture um, practice is 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 directly directly affecting so here uh, their way of managing water resources so uh, uh, they collect water uh, as an irrigation pond and uh, and use for and better use of uh, these uh, these scarce resources here <coughs> we we applied um, a water wall a, a policy support tool for understanding what's the uh, rainfall pattern what's the um, uh, what's the uh, annual water balance so that is availability of water for for agricultural use so here runoff in, uh, along the river and and uh, what's the human footprint uh, in, the, in the catchments based on uh, agricultural practices um, grazing uh, human human intervention in, in, the, in the catchments, all those things, and uh, an aggregate of bundle of ecosystem services as well as realized. So it it also considers um, various services, including uh, water, land, pasture land, and and uh, species richness as well. So here is uh, one interesting findings. So so on the left. We used uh, policy support tools, and on, on the right, that's the observed value. So, why um, in, in some areas in, uh, like this, and in remote areas, why uh, this one, this kind of um, policy support tool is relevant? So here we can see the annual runoff at the at the at the diversion of these two two villages is almost equal to observed values. Although uh, that's that's from only three years of year of data and this one is from uh, almost 50 years of data so uh, it's it, it is uh, it might be coincident so these these two values are quite uh, quite matching but we again we, we have installed um, a water level sensor here to understand for the next uh, few years of uh, data so we can we can understand better so uh, the water availability in that in that part <coughs> So in, in mountain environment, so the major uncertainties, um, as I said, um, lack of consist consistency in, in data, uh, the monitoring of hydrological stations, all the hydro hydrological attributes, these are not uh, quite consistent uh, without mobilizing local communities, changing hydroclimatic patterns, and past land use as well as future land use practices, we don't know all those things so these are main uncertainties we need to deal with and uh, we also don't have uh, detailed information about the de uh, demographic socioeconomic and and the migration issues which are rapidly uh, rapidly evolving as a major uncertainties for ecosystem services management and finally <coughs> um, we come to a conclusion that we need still strong citizen science perspectives for better understanding of ecosystem services um, in that environment. For, for example, understanding changing snowfall and rainfall patterns. Um, advancing, based on that, advancing mountain EBO practices and integrating them into decision making. Uh, and uh, in terms of the policy support tools, we could apply a water wall and invest tools uh, to, to characterize uh, various ecosystem services and, and, and integrating into policy support system. And after all, uh, in that environment, local stakeholders, local communities, decision makers, government, NGOs, they don't have enough capacities, so we have to train them about, uh, <clears throat> about that science as well as, uh, as, well as the, the decision making tools. So that will have <coughs> um, long lasting uh, positive impact in ecosystem services management. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Due to the technological glitches, we're um, short on time, but I'd like to allow just a little bit of time for one or two quick questions. Yes.
And thank you for a very lively and with, with lots of lovely emails to, to your presentation. I just wanted to ask, you seem to uh, uh, suggest that there is a need for time series data on the one hand, and then also there is a need for citizen science. But how do you then uh, match these two things? Sometimes I believe that when you engage with people, and every time you go back, probably you struggle to find the same people or you know, try to engage with the same uh, population that who probably have provided you the data in the first instance. That is to say that can it be compatible, the citizen science produced data with, with the you know, time series monitoring data? Yeah, um, the time series and, uh, <clears throat> and compatibility with the, with the uh, um, citizen science data, that's, uh, I think that's quite uh, uh, a bit different. But uh, uh, in citizen science, what we do, uh, we, we work with uh, local um, communities, very local level institutions, um, and, uh, and, and mobilizing them to, to, to maintain stations. Uh, for example, local NGOs, local youth clubs, all those uh, very locally active um, agents which, uh, uh, which are voluntarily uh, uh, involved in this kind of data collection. So, um, so in, in longer term, um, uh, it, 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 it is quite contextual whether we, we can have this similar set of um, local institutions or local stakeholders in, uh, in, in maintaining monitoring stations, but, uh, but it, it is quite contextual, but we have to mobilize them so the stations can be, can be in longer term, so they generate data for, for scientific purpose or scientific or policy purpose. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just trying to find the next speakers. <laughs> this has been Sarah and Fabrice, you're not here. No. There's been the change in the program and maybe they're not aware of it. So, no, not <coughs> the new program. Thank you. But maybe there's time then for another question while we wait for the next speakers. Um, were there any other questions? No. Oh, yes, there's one. Maybe it was partly touched, but I wonder how you ensure that the data uh, your citizens collect is of good quality. Can you really help us to understand that? Um, yeah. <coughs> uh, in terms of the quality, um, uh, we work. I mean, the it is not um, uh, it is not completely handing over all these stations from the beginning. Once. Um, they have enough capacity to understand data, to, um, uh, to collect all this data. So, so in terms of the quality, uh, it will be quite reliable in the longer term. So, uh, so to make a good quality, so the, there should be training. There should be some capacity building uh, at, at local level, so with, which we are also doing. We are working very closely with, uh, with, with those uh, actors. Um, and making them uh, quite aware about the different sets of data, hydrological, meteorological data. Uh, so, so the collected data will be as, uh, as high standard as, as any other scientific, uh, uh, um, I mean, the uh, uh, institutions who, who are directly collecting. Thank you. Um, so we still don't seem to have our next speakers here. Um, the old program and the new program look slightly different. Caroline is here, who is the next speaker, who's supposed to only speak after the coffee break. So we have a plan B, but I just want to see if Julie comes back uh, with our other speakers, because there may be others who want to join for Caroline's talk after coffee. They may have planned it that way. Uh, so yes, he has another question. This is slight, slight, thanks, Purbal. I mean, it, it was interesting, but this is slightly outside of what you presented. But I mean, was there any consideration in, given in your framing to indigenous knowledge, or the situation, the, the two epistemologies, 
scientific knowledge and indigenous knowledge. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's very important in in mountain environments where uh, it, it different sets of indigenous knowledge uh, systems are 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 working, and uh, we don't know. I mean, from outside, we don't know what kind of uh, management practices are they are doing in in different different regions. So in in, in citizen science uh, perspective, um, what we do. We just listen to them. So what kind of management practices they are doing in terms of water resources management or, or land management practices. For example, in that part of Himalayas, the land management practices is quite, uh, quite unique uh, in terms of uh, how they, they, they protect um, agricultural land from degradation. So, um, so that kind of knowledge is, is quite important. Uh, to maintain um, land resources. So yeah, definitely um, indigenous knowledge is, is, is one of uh, the main, uh, uh, main factors uh, that we, we, we cover in incision science. Thank you, and I see our speaker has arrived. <laughs> we can move on with the program. So next up, Fabrice, uh, talking about their work on the sustainable development goals and making ecosystem services count. Uh, Fabrice, is it uploaded already? Yeah. Okay, that would be great. And there's a microphone up here for you, unless you want this one. Okay. Uh, the yeah, lapel one. Do this one. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Oh, ap apologies for making uh, Belinda run. I, I picked up a schedule this morning that said I was after coffee, so I was enjoying the talks with Christos. Um, yeah, so, uh, apology. Uh, so uh, my name's uh, Fabrice de Klerk, so thank you all for, for being here. I work with Biodiversity International and the CGIR, uh, specifically the CGIR research program on, on water, land and ecosystems, which is trying to look at how uh, ecosystem service-based approaches can be brought into play looking at the agricultural uh, development. Uh, the work that I'm going to present today is a collaboration with uh, Biodiversity and the Natural Capital Project, so which is on top of that, a, uh, a group of four organizations, uh, the Nature Conservancy, Stanford University, University of Minnesota, and World Wildlife Fund. And we also received some funding from uh, SNAP, which is a Science for Ni Nature and People uh, program in, uh, in California. So, so what I wanted to present was some work that we've been doing, really trying to understand how we, uh, as working in agricultural development, can better prepare ourselves in engaging with uh, agricultural rural development in, uh, in Africa, Southeast Asia, and Latin America, and, and understand how we can understand the impacts of those uh, interventions on ecosystem services and human well-being. So how can we link our work to these SDGs? And so what I'll present today is some of the conceptual framework, but also a tool we've been developing called MESH, which is mapping ecosystem services and, uh, and human well-being. The uh, co-presenters here, Sarah Jones, who's in the other room, um, but she'll come in just in time for questions, hopefully. Uh, Sylvia Wood, who's a postdoc with Biodiversity in Columbia University. And then Justin Johnson, who's responsible for really the, the modeling protocol and the technical details, who's with the Nature Conservancy and the University of Minnesota. So, uh, so Belinda presented this this morning, right? And I think we have a tremendous opportunity looking at the SDGs as a, a means by which we can reflect on the role of ecosystem services in addressing these, uh, these global goals. And I think one of the things that we recognize when we see these goals is really the tremendous need for integrated approaches that allow us to make the link between different goals and to highlight how interventions that target one goal might influence others. And I think it's particularly relevant for ecosystem service-based approaches, which shift us from looking at goals 14 and 15, the environmental ones, as specific goals, but which allow us to ask the question, what's the role of environment in achieving uh, these other goals, hunger, disease, energy, uh, and health, amongst others? So that's one of the things I think we're trying to do with uh, this model. One of the papers that really struck us this year was uh, Jan Jauk Liu's work with Hal Mooney and several others, really calling for and highlighting this need for a systems-based approach in, uh, in global sustainability. And they present three models which they propose are, are taking us in that direction. The ecosystem service model, the environmental footprint uh, model, and then the planetary boundaries model. 
And for those of us working in agriculture, what I think this really represented to us is that when we look at uh, these three conceptualizations, is we see agriculture as a primary driver of surpassing planetary boundaries, as a primary driver of increasing uh, environmental footprints, as a primary driver of changing those services that we receive and not receive. And so it begs the question, I think, for us, is if agriculture has such an important role in driving these boundaries, then it probably is a very important solution space as well. So how can we look at agriculture, transform agriculture, and make agriculture a means by which these boundaries are reduced or by which we return into these boundaries? The other thing uh, that I think really called our attention is when we look at these three models, there's something fundamentally different about the ecosystem service model. And that of the three models, it's the only one which proposes a solution. Right? And when we talk about planetary boundaries and environmental footprints, it's what our impact is. But when we look at ecosystem services, it says it really shifts the dialogue away from environment as a victim of development to environment as a means to development. And so I think that's what really caught our, our attention when we began looking at uh, ecosystem service uh, frameworks. And really, what's the capacity then of looking at uh, this uh, first one, the ecosystem service framework, as a solution space for achieving these SDGs? And again, I think that's what's exciting about looking at ecosystem services and the SDGs. It's really a solution space that we can begin to explore. So I bit out of breath from running from the other building. <laughs> So uh, one of the first things we did several years ago was then try to develop an ecosystem service uh, framework for the CGIR. So what does it mean to have an ecosystem service-based approach in agriculture? And the point that, that I think that we wanted to highlight here, well, several points I'd like to highlight, is that when we think about Belinda's presentation about the Anthropocene, what we recognize in the Anthropocene is that the biggest ecosystem of the Anthropocene is agricultural ecosystems. And these are also the ecosystems that are closest to human well-being. So again, really, I think, emphasizing that this is our opportunity to link ecosystem service-based approaches to, to well-being. There's only so much we can do in protected areas, but in agricultural landscapes, really, it's open to any kind of intervention. I think really broad open into how agriculture can influence uh, those service provisioning. So what we see when we look at the agricultural systems is one, this dual nature of agricultural systems. Dual nature from the point of view of being dependent on ecosystem services. We need pollinators, we need pest control, we need soils, we need fertile soils. And we, I think we have a tendency to say, well, forests provide these, but those services aren't as important forests as they are in agriculture. I mean, these are where we really have that link between those services and yield and production functions and these well-being functions. The second important point is that agriculture, while being dependent on ecosystem services, can also be a net provider of ecosystem services. And that is, decisions in how we manage our cultural landscapes can convert agriculture from net degraders of the environment to net service providers. So can we begin to imagine an agricultural system, an agricultural landscape, that stores carbon, that provides clean water, that reduces disease risk, that provides whole of diet nutrition rather than just looking at agriculture produce uh, calories. So two, the two dimensions of, uh, of agriculture and ecosystem services. The other point, again, being that when we work in the CGIR and start talking about ecosystem services, a lot of our colleagues were saying, is this just conservation, uh, hiding under the context of, of development? And so really, really pushed us to say, if you're going to talk about ecosystem service and development, you have to get the people that I mentioned right, and you have to be able to articulate what this is going to mean in terms of getting people out of poverty, reducing hunger, increasing food security. So I think one of the things that we're still struggling with, although we've made some progress with, is really getting this people dimension uh, correct. The, uh, the points then we have then, uh, these one, two, three, four, fives, is one is that when we look about ecosystem services and agricultural development, one, people's fundamental, so we have to get the people dimension right, and we have to be able to articulate the impacts on people. Two, uh, is that when we talk about our cultural landscapes, again, the room for interventions is very high. In agriculture, we're used to moving soil around. We're used to moving water around. We're used to moving biodiversity around. And so the scope of what we might do that can be called an ecosystem service-based approach is really quite broad, much broader, I think, than in protected areas with a much more limited scope as to what we might be able to do. The third point is uh, this need to look at multi-scale, multi-time uh, approach, so really landscapes as an appropriate context for looking at uh, ecosystem service-based approaches. The, the fourth point is that we're going to need novel uh, institutions, novel governance mechanisms that allow us to really make this link between uh, nature, agriculture, and, and people. So whether it's PS, whether it's laws, whether it's taxes, whether it's certification, 
but I think we fundamentally need to think about what are these new institutions that will help us to make that link and help us to articulate those values. And then the fifth one is uh, this notion of resilience. Recognize that when we're talking about uh, the agroecosystems and social ecosystems, that these are complex adaptive systems, they're constantly going to change, and change is the norm. So what is this, uh, what is the added value of an ecosystem service-based approach in terms of providing that resilience or adapting to change compared to maybe some great infrastructure approaches? So uh, when, so it's really about designing multifunctional landscapes. And when we look at landscapes, we're expecting those landscapes to provide us with uh, food production and nutrition, carbon storage, water availability, uh, water quality, in terms of eutrophication, a disease risk, there was just a presentation next door on irrigated systems and malaria, uh, transportation, hydropower, space for biodiversity, and building materials, a recreation space, and that when we look at these, we see that there's really these links to a multitude of SDGs. And so again, when we think about agricultural landscapes, we see that these are actually quite active places for meeting multiple SDG goals. So with our group, we did a little bit of thinking about, well, which of these SDGs really are the ones that are most influenced by environmental change in agricultural landscapes? And we find that there's some very direct links with, uh, with food production, some very direct links with health, both from the dietary pathways as well as through disease transmission pathways. Very nice and close links with uh, water quality, how we manage agriculture can impact water quality quite heavily. Close interactions with affordable and clean energy, I think some growing interest and considerations as what the impact is on sustainable cities, peri-urban agricultural systems, and closed loop thinking, climate action, and of course the two environmental ones. But again, I think the big point here is that it provides an opportunity to look at environment, but not from the point of view of specific environmental goals, but how does environment become the leverage point or an action point in meeting these other SDGs. And that's what we want to explore a bit more closely with this uh, MESH model. So we've become quite decent at modeling some service supply. There's the whole series of, of models that the Natural Capital Project has developed. There's the ARIES uh, programming. There's uh, Mark Mulligan's Costing Nature and, and Water World. But we're still not quite there yet in terms of linking it to policy and, and to human well-being. So a lot of our models still are talking about biophysical measures and aren't quite yet communicating the language that a lot of our decision makers uh, care about. So what we did with this project uh, was to see whether we could develop a platform by which we could begin to look at multiple services and also see if we could become better at articulating the outcomes of services in the language that was important to uh, the policymakers that we were talking about. So we, we held a series of uh, four workshops. First one uh, in Santa Barbara with people working on stable development goals, trying to see how we could interpret uh, SDGs in ecosystem service language. The second workshop where we went to East and West Africa, met with ministries of health, ministries of environment, ministries of, of water, uh, ministries of, uh, of agriculture, and asked them whether our interpretation of services uh, and goals resonated with them and what were their priorities. I mean, here, a lot of dialogue between those ministries about the usefulness of these kinds of approaches in helping them to articulate their vision, their perspectives, their priorities to uh, their parallel ministries. Uh, irrigation was quite quite interested in being able to uh, infer or talk to the, the Forest Commission. The health sector was very interested in being able to go to agriculture and say, look, this is what the impact of intervention is on human health and how do we begin to mitigate some of these, uh, these impacts. A third workshop was then the, the model design team, which did all the programming. And then the last workshop in Rome, we brought our stakeholders back together in Rome and asked them to critique uh, the model, its, uh, its platform, its interface, and how it worked. So again, the key points that we saw coming out from our consultations with our decision makers was, one, if we're going to talk about ecosystem services, it had to include food security. There was zero interest from any of the partners to have an ecosystem service model that didn't have food security as a comparison value. A second, uh, I think a great emphasis on water scarcity and land degradation, a lot of concerns about transboundary uh, water management, and then nutrition, again, increasingly becoming uh, high on the list. So not just food production in terms of yield and calories, but really whole of diet, and where does that whole of diet come from? So what we also found is that, of course, this is really complicated. When we begin looking at the SDGs, you know, what were the kinds of indicators that we might be able to include as modelers? We looked at water quality and runoff, total annual growth of soil erosion. We linked these two SDGs and, again, identified that there's multiple uh, service-based indicators linked to multiple SDGs. 
when you look at specific services, it gets even messier. And so I think one of the primary things that we saw is that we need to find a way by which we could take this complexity and help our decision makers and help ourselves communicate these multiple linkages in a much more simplified manner. So, so what Justin proposes is that this really resembles a diamond-shaped process in terms of complexity. So we have sometimes, if you want, relatively simple front-end uh, inputs in terms of what are the, the scenarios. I mean, people have are able to articulate what their vision is, what's an intervention they're going to put in place. We're going to increase irrigation area by 100 uh, square kilometers. People have a fairly good idea also of you know, what the back end is. You know, they want to be able to distill results, compare decisions. So fairly simple output that's very useful, again, in influencing decision making, but a really messy internal process in terms of what are these multiple interactions between multiple ecosystem services and how does that then link back into these kinds of outcomes. And so what the MeSH model tries to do is it tries to focus on a very user-friendly front-end process, a very user-friendly back-end process, and then a model that takes care of that internal results, letting people decide what are the kinds of services that they were interested in. So it's, it's really about a five-step process, and here I think a lot of the emphasis that we had uh, from our partners is link your work to uh, investment decisions. Is it a new road? Is it a new irrigation structure? Is it the construction of an agricultural corridor in Tanzania? Use that to generate scenarios with your, with your partners uh, from management and other drivers and begin to articulate or at least consider how those different scenarios might impact ecosystem dynamics. Translate those into ecosystem service supplies and services and I think that the most important step, and one that we're still really working on, is, is translating those very biophysical type outputs into SDG targets. So can we move from these very ecosystem service-based models looking at water yield, hydropower, carbon storage, et cetera, to progress toward achievement of SDG 2.2 malnutrition. So here, an indicator might be the landscape nutritional potential. What is you know, the nutritional yield of a landscape versus just you know, the caloric yield of that landscape? So this is uh, what the MeSH model looks like. And the second half of the presentation, which will go a bit faster, I'll focus on, um, on the MeSH model, how it works, uh, and then I'll show you where you might be able to download it. But it really follows the same uh, steps. One is a scenario generator. Uh, two, you can select which ecosystem services you're interested in. And here, you know, we're looking at the Volta Basin in Western Africa. Third, you could run uh, different models against those scenarios. And then there's two output type formats. One is based on a results output, you know, graphical map output. And the second one is a report output. So we're trying to see whether we can embed here the creation of reports that might be relevant for our national partners trying to report on uh, sustainable development goals. So uh, some of the process in here, one, you can create a new project, set an area of interest or a shapefile. So one of the things that Justin really emphasized when he developed this model is he wanted people to be able to download the program and run, run the program without any external inputs. So at the core of the MeSH model are global data sets. So you can run this at very coarse resolutions without any additional inputs, or you can bring in your own uh, high resolution data uh, instead. You can then select which models to run. So what are the ecosystem services that are prioritized in that landscape? Is it nutrient retention? Is it hydropower, water yield? Is it carbon storage, et cetera? You can then create your scenarios. So do you want to look at a change in demographics, change in climate, change in economies type scenarios? And you build uh, the files for that. But again, uh, wanting to ensure that people could run this without bringing their own data, we embedded several different scenario options. I'm sorry you can't see this very well, but there's a Unistert defined folder. There's a series of invest scenario generators. There's the climate uh, models that you can bring in. And then we're working on one that would look at uh, return on investment, another one that would look at trade-off frontiers, and another one that would look at uh, market change simulators. So we're building in these tools that will allow people to build scenarios uh, in a fairly automated process. You set up run to run each of the, the models. You can ensure that each of the selected models is ready for a full mesh run. So you run each of these individually to make sure that all the parameters have been met. You get these nice green lights and yes, Justin says yay when the lights are ticked green. You click run and here's I think the other 
or I think novel feature about Mesh is it allows you to run multiple models and do comparison amongst multiple ecosystem services. So once you've selected what services and what scenarios, you could run this as a batch. And what this allows you to do is then have these comparisons between multiple services and begin to do these trade-off analysis be between uh, multiple types of outputs. So here you can potentially run thousands of combinations looking at how different scenarios impact uh, these services and their trade-offs. Uh, you check to see whether your, your run has worked. You run other scenario model pairs if you want. So you can uh, obviously modify things as you want. This creates then uh, a raw data with spatial outputs. And you uh, then have the facility to look at the maps that are generated. And Justin, again, is embedded in here the capacity to change colors, change lessons, do some of the very basic GIS formatting in Mesh itself. So you don't even have to be an expert in using ArcGIS to be able to tweak some of the maps according to what you might want them to look like in your report. You can save those into your scenarios output folder. And then the other, I think, really novel feature is that in addition to uh, this is the map button, there's a report button. And so here you can generate, there's automated text that generates text reports based on the model run that you would like. So that then creates a dynamically created report that you can export into Microsoft Word and adapt or reformat as you might, uh, might need. I see Belinda's getting ready to stand up. So I'm almost done, two slides. So uh, the other feature then again is multiple outputs. This is another important take home message from our stakeholders. Some of the ministry people said that they wanted stories, so they wanted the narrative. Others said they wanted the, the economic comparison between services. Others were more interested in the maps, particularly looking at relationships. Others were looking for trade off frontiers between multiple scenarios. And so one of the things that we've really put a lot of attention here is trying to generate these multiple outco outcome formats so that this can be useful to either research communities, decision makers, or even uh, landscape of planners. So uh, last slide, next steps. And here you have uh, Sarah, who just stepped into the back, uh, Justin in the light blue shirt, and Sylvie at Columbia. So continuing to work with uh, model improvement. So this is an ongoing project that we're uh, hoping to continue to build on. It's embedded in the natural capital uh, family of models, which are open source, freely accessible, but again, they are constantly being evolved and adapted. We're running multi-model comparisons, looking at different model environments that provide, uh, compare the same services. And Mark Mulligan will report on some of that tomorrow. We're testing this against uh, the Volta Basin Authority's uh, strategic action plan. So there, there's a, a multi-million dollar plan that involves changes in landscapes for ecosystem services that we're working with that team to see how our model runs and also to try to develop some comparisons for their outcomes. And then interfacing with our national partners to test the output formats. Again, continued effort to want to ensure that we present results in a way that's relevant to our stakeholders. And then finally, uh, working on new model components on fish and livestock production, pest control, and crop yield, and hopefully bringing in a malaria model as well. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your time and attention. And I'll hand over the mic. Thanks, Fabrice. Uh, can we see if there are a couple of questions from the audience? Uh, yes, there's one over there. Thank you. I found that very interesting. Um, I was kind of envisaged just asking myself the question about, you're talking about an R&D effort and the Volta Basin te test case, but where would we might we be in, say, five or ten years with this? I mean, are we talking about a model of the whole world, as essentially at the landscape scale like this? Because I guess that's what we'd actually need. So some thoughts on where this would go, how quickly it could go, and what resources it would take would sort of be quite interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's th thanks for that question. Um, so, so right now, you know, the model is scale independent. But of course, depending on which service you're looking at, there's going to be some important caveats as to uh, how each of the specific pest control, water, et cetera, based models run. Uh, several people in the NatCap team have used this to run global analyses. Uh, and so there, I think it's been quite useful for just stimulating conversation as to what the scale of impact of an income service approach might mean and where you might want to prioritize certain services over others. Uh, but we're envisioning it uh, really uh, in this form 
trying to use it more in direct assistance with our, our national partners that are looking at how they're going to achieve the SDGs and what the influence of uh, ecosystem services might be in achieving those. So, so trying to use it as a tool to get that cross-disciplinary dialogue going and try to get environmental interventions on the radar and part of that planning process for, uh, for the SDG planning. So that's, that's two of the places where you imagine it going. I don't think that MESH in particular, is, it's not going down the route of the you know, predictive modeling, but much more into a planning, uh, dialogue, trade-off analysis uh, tool uh, to, to help bring that to the forefront and try to understand what some of these unknown unknowns are. You know, we, you know, we were expecting to put in 100,000 hectares of irrigation. We're finding this impact that you know, wasn't on our radar before we ran uh, this kind of analysis. Thanks, Fabrice. Time for one quick question. Thank you very much. It was really interesting. I just had two quick questions. First, uh, does, uh, does MESH module provide like valuation of ecosystem services? And secondly, I'm not a technical guy, but I have heard there is another, uh, uh, there are other modules like Envist. How is this different than uh, those modules? Yeah, good Thank you. Question. So, um, so it will provide economic valuation. Be one of the outputs that is uh, that's permitted. And uh, in terms of how is different than invest, uh, this is invest if you want. It's, uh, so when you look at those different ecosystem servers that you want to run, all the invest models are included. And we've also brought in uh, water world and costing nature. So Mark Mulligan's ecosystem service models. So it's not, it's not a new ecosystem service model per se. The things that Mesh does differently is it allows you to compare between multiple services in a single run. Uh, it's fully integrative, so you don't need to bring in uh, outside data, at least for your core skill analysis. And then it translates the invest uh, type of results of these service models into uh, SDG indicators. And that's something that we're paying a lot of attention to, is how are the SDG indicators being defined? And we'll continuously being adapting those outputs so that they become as closely tied as possible to uh, the SDG indicators as they're developed. So, so uh, it's it's in the family of models that NatCap uh, has been uh, building with us. So this is it's hosted on the same the same site as Invest in Rios, and Rios does the uh, is a resource optimization model. This the economic analysis. So the the first link there is uh, is the site where you can download Mesh. Uh, the second site is a CGIR a blog called Thrive, which I make a quick pitch for because it's a great uh, watering tank for those of you that are interested in ecosystem services, agriculture, and development. So those are two resources which I would encourage any of you to, uh, to explore and to provide us feedback on. Thanks, Fabrice, and thanks everyone for your attention. Um, it's now time for the coffee break, if my agenda serves me correctly. Um, and that carries on until quarter to four. Um, and if I could ask you to be back then for the final session of the day before we go to drink.